Sometimes things that initially look like they might be great turn out to be a massive disappointment, like fat-free ice cream or Sea of Thieves. What? Too soon? It happens all the time in video games, where you'll often find yourself in possession of a weapon or ability that seems great at first, only to discover that when you use them, they're in fact more trouble than they're worth. Here are just some of the times we've encountered that very thing I just said. Enjoy and beware minor spoilers for the following games. Metal Gear Solid 5 is a game that rewards patience, stealth and non-lethality, which is why the Diamond Dogs research department spends so much time and money on developing stealth gadgets that, to you or I, might seem a bit, what's the word, stupid. 660,000 GMP well spent. It's also why, though it might seem like a cool idea at first, calling in air support is way, way more trouble than it's worth. In The Phantom Pain, the Diamond Dogs have access to a helicopter codenamed Pequod, which is both heavily armed and one of the only places on Mother Base fitted out with a tape deck. Honestly, there's got to be a better way to listen to Billy Idol. Pequod picks you up and drops you off when there are missions to do, but can also be called in to attack targets and provide covering fire. This is something that you should absolutely never do, because Pequod is about as much use as giving a one-eyed man a pair of binoculars. I expect you'll become quite familiar with those binoculars as you plan your next move. Starting to see a pattern emerging here. Call in air support on your iDroid and Pequod storms in, playing his music at full volume and starts strafing everything in sight with miniguns, even if you've upgraded him with missiles and would rather he try and take down the tanks that are giving you trouble, please. The helicopter is also made of tissue paper, judging by how long it can stay airborne before having to retreat due to having taken heavy fire. And it costs you a small fortune every time you want to use it. I gotta pull out! And if you do use air support, it locks off being able to get a perfect S rank for the mission. An A rank is the highest you can hope for, although that seems pretty unlikely considering how much collateral damage, carnage and non-mission critical death Pequod and his miniguns are likely to cause in the brief period before he's shot down. Still, you get to hear some sweet Kim Wilde, and I mean, how else are you going to do that out in the field? With your Walkman? I mean, yes, that would work, now that I think about it. Hey, research team, how are things going working up that MP3 player idea? Oh, they talk now. Yeah, that's good too, I guess. Fight! Street Fighter's resident pro wrestler Rainbow Mika understands that to be a successful pro wrestler, your mic skills need to be at least as flashy as your tights. More flashy ideally, although looking at her outfit, I'm not sure that's even possible. I'll kick your ass! Alright, let's begin! Yes, professional wrestling is just as much about being deadly on the microphone as it is about being deadly in the ring. So when it was announced that Armika's V-Skill was going to incorporate her cutting a promo, we were intrigued. On paper at least, Mika's microphone performance V-Skill sounds great. It enhances the power of her throws, and the longer the buttons are held down and the longer Mika talks for, the greater this buff gets. To the point where she's adding 800% damage to her throws, enough to virtually kill anyone with a single hit. The problem with this is the fact that it takes almost 20 seconds for Armika to deliver her full speech, and if you've ever played Street Fighter, you'll know that your chances of not getting punch kicked or shuriukened into oblivion in that time are slightly less than those of a McFlurry under a blowtorch. 
Sure, you can abandon the promo in the middle of it and still get a nice damage boost and even do a bit of damage by throwing the mic at your opponent, but really, unless you're fighting an enemy who's willing to stand still while you lecture them about your training regime, you're probably out of luck. Still, there is some nice motivational stuff in there if you're willing to listen, although I'd rather hear an explanation as to where that microphone came from. Oh god, there's a fighter jet. Oh no! Oh no! I'm being attacked by a fighter jet. Whoa! There's a oh guy my god, I airborne. Got, I got killed Yikes. by a fighter jet. Yeah, there's a fighter jet straight in me. Oh no! 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 I'm airborne! I'm flipped! I'm in a riverbed. After you've been killed by the same player multiple times in GTA Online, it's natural to want revenge. And nothing says, I really wish you would f**k off, like atomizing them with a giant space cannon. The orbital cannon, added with the Doomsday Heist update, is without a shadow of a doubt, the most powerful weapon in the game. This truly is the checkered flag in the GTA Online arms race, insta-killing anyone it hits. The only drawback to this staggeringly effective and massively illegal weapon is that it is also staggeringly and massively expensive. The installation of the cannon's targeting system in your underground facility alone is a hefty $900,000. I'm assuming that's $10,000 to install the computers and $890,000 in bribes to keep the builders quiet. It's then a whopping $500,000 GTA Online dollars for a single manually targeted shot. But why risk the possibility that you might miss? Better not to cheap out and instead spend the full $750,000 on a player seeking automatic shot. Make strike, go now! Whoa. I obliterated Willy the Kid with the orbital cannon. <laughs> that cost me three quarters of a million dollars. Must not say totally worth it. Must not say totally worth it. <clears throat> totally worth it. It is though. All this virtual largesse would be silly enough if it was just in-game money that could otherwise be spent on more permanent stuff, like vehicles or player housing. But remember, you can spend real money on GTA Online dollars. That means every time you fire this thing, it could be your wallet that takes collateral damage. Based on the cost of the Bullshark card in-game currency DLC, even the cheaper option of 500k is $9.99 of real, actual money up in smoke. How exactly are you going to explain to your children that they can't go to college because you blew all your savings on smiting your online enemies from space? You'll need some sort of diagram, I guess. Like this. And yes, you'll notice that there was just the one clip of us firing the orbital cannon in this segment. Make strike, go now! What do you think, we're made of money? Let's see that one more time. Make strike, go now! Come in, chosen one. There are things you must know. The village is dying. The signs are everywhere. Withering crops. Dying Brahmin. Sick children. Though many people's first experience with the Fallout series was the excellent Fallout 3, Fallout 3 is actually a sequel to the game called Fallout 2, because that's how numbers work. Fallout 2 cast you as the Chosen One, tasked with retrieving a Garden of Eden creation kit to save your home from a terrible drought. The old discs speak of an item called the Garden of Eden creation kit. It is said it can bring life to the wasteland. Along the way, you battled fierce enemies, scavenged to survive, encountered intelligent deathclaws, and took on the might of the Enclave, the remnants of the US government who are now running things with their superior firepower. Vice President Byrd may look like a drooling idiot, but I'll have you know, that man's a national hero. It is, to put it mildly, kind of hard work, but eventually, after hour upon hour of fighting, killing and surviving, you destroy the Enclave's oil rig and save the day, upon which you are rewarded by the character Father Tully, a weird monk who is drunk all the time. A drunk monk, if you will. What's weird about this encounter is that Tully seems to be aware you're in a video game, and what's more, has strong opinions about the fact that people never finish games anymore. To reward you for your stick to he presents you with what on the surface appears to be the greatest gift that anyone in Fallout 2 could receive, a Fallout 2 hint book. When used, the hint book gives you 10,000 experience points, boosts all of your stats to 300%, boosts your hit points to the maximum 999, and sets all of your special stats to the maximum 10. 
Basically, this hint book makes you a god of the wasteland, which would be great if you didn't get it right at the end of the game when you have literally no use for it. The game even acknowledges it with the book's in-game description, which reads, well this would have been good to have at the beginning of the goddamn game. Still, maybe you can use it as a fire lighter? Make paper aeroplanes to pass the time. Pop it on your head to improve your posture? Help me out here, Fallout 2. Speaking of Fallout, the following game in the Fallout series, the sensibly named Fallout 3, features one of the greatest video game weapons ever devised. That is, the Fat Man Launcher, which is even less practical than that somewhat misleading name implies. The Fat Man Launcher is essentially a giant shoulder-mounted catapult that flings mini nukes at people. It weighs a ton, does an enormous amount of damage, and should absolutely not be used indoors. Unless you finally had enough of annoying Radio DJ 3 Dog. It turns out, however, that there's an even more awesome, even less practical version of the Fat Man launcher called the Experimental Merv, which functions just like the Fat Man, except that it launches eight mini-nukes simultaneously. Given that even the biggest boss in the game only requires about two mini-nukes to take down, this weapon is the very definition of overkill. There's also the fact that there are only 72 mini-nukes in the entire game, meaning that at most, you can only fire this weapon nine times before running out of ammunition forever. And that's if you can afford to fire it in the first place. With mini-nukes costing a couple of hundred caps apiece, you're looking at close to 2,000 caps every time you want to unleash radioactive hell. And it's also worth noting that it is fantastically dangerous. Trying to use it in vats almost always leads to you dying, due to the fact that half the nukes will smash into the ground in front of you and go off. So, although it seems like it might be cool, the experimental Merv is actually a lot more trouble than it's worth. And if you see anyone with one, I would recommend getting to a minimum safe distance. Probably somewhere in Skyrim would do. Avatar! Know that Britannia has entered into a new age of enlightenment. Know that the time has finally come for the one true Lord of Britannia to take his place at the head of his people. Under my guidance, Britannia will flourish, and all of the people shall rejoice and pay homage to their new guardian. Think of all the people who've ever wronged you. Traffic wardens, internet commenters, Matthew Vincent from school, who still owes me at least £32.46 in stolen lunch money. Imagine if you could make them all disappear just by speaking a few words. That's the gist of the Armageddon spell from the Ultima series, which is the most literal name for an RPG item since Morrowind's Boots of Blinding Speed. <laughs> blinding Speed. I get it. Very funny. I did a whole quest to get those. Yes, casting Armageddon really does cause the end of the world, killing every single creature apart from the person who cast the spell. Oh, and Lord British, because he made the game, so he makes the rules. Because he's the alter ego of the game designer Richard Gary. It's, it's a whole thing, don't worry about it. Initially, casting Armageddon seems like a brilliant idea, given that every enemy in the game is immediately vanquished, allowing you to explore the world of maze-like dungeons without the danger of imminent death. Then you realise that also no longer around are bystanders, shopkeepers and quest givers, rendering the game completely unwinnable. You had best not do that, Avatar. It's like a theme park with no queues, but also no one to operate the rides. Oh, you can still take photos with the costumed characters. They're just a lot more upsetting. Armageddon finally got its moment of glory in Ultima 9, where you had to cast it at the very end of the game to defeat the final boss. The game cheats a bit though, because you're within a protective field that means the spell only affects the two of you, rebounding around and turning you both into ash while everyone else in the world survives. In all its other incarnations though, Armageddon really does live up to its name, wiping out all life on the planet. Apparently the spell exists in the series almost as a joke, because you'd have to be completely off your rocker to think that performing it is a good idea. 
So what you're saying is, if I were to use Armageddon, everyone I know and love would be killed just to exact revenge on a small handful of people. Matthew Vincent, you are toast. I was about to suggest that very thing. Yes, you must certainly deserve a reward. There is but one gift I can give that is equal in value to the Elder Scroll and my daughter. I offer you my blood. Take it and you will walk as a lion among sheep. Men will tremble at your approach and you will never fear death again. Now I know what you're thinking, being a vampire lord would be awesome. You get fangs, a cape, and, if the vampire movies I've seen are anything to go by, amazing cheekbones. Not so in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, which showed us the many downsides of turning into a vampire in 2012's Dawnguard DLC. For all the benefits that being a vampire lord gives you, such as immunity to disease, increased magic powers, and mastery over clouds of bats, it also immediately offsets these due to the fact that being a vampire is a huge pain in the neck. No pun intended. Alright, some pun intended, but it's still true. For a start, you're weaker to fire and weak to sunlight, with drastically reduced health, stamina, and magicka regen during the day. Then there's the fact that everyone hates vampires and will attack you on sight once you hit stage 4 of your vampire powers, or whenever you're in your vampire form, which it must be said is seriously hideous. Vampires are supposed to be sexy! There is no way Todd Howard doesn't know that. Look at him, he's definitely read Twilight. The biggest drawback of all, however, is that being in your vampire form forces you to play in third person, which I know a lot of people prefer, but I play Skyrim in first person, and the second you force me to switch perspective, I instantly forget how to fight, do magic, or walk in a straight line. It doesn't help that the vampire lord form is about 9 feet tall as well. I see why vampire fiction leaves out all the scenes when a vampire gets stuck in a door and then falls down a flight of stairs trying to get to his sleeping prey. In order to stay at the lower levels of vampirism, where people won't just run up and stab you on sight, you need to periodically feed from NPCs, which, surprise, is a crime, so look forward to constantly being on the run from the law as well. Long story short, while it might seem like a cool idea at first, becoming a vampire is way, way more trouble than it's worth. Right, Serana? It's definitely been a bad thing, on the whole. Yeah, no kidding. Behold the power! I offer. Thank you so much for watching this video. Do like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we do videos in future. Something that hopefully won't be disappointing are these videos from us. Up here we have the movie moments that were ruined by the game adaptations. And down here we have a video from Outside Extra about weird ways you control NPCs. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.